All right, in this video, we're going to talk about how uh, classification has changed uh, with these new modern classification systems based on phylogeny, based on evolutionary history. So evolutionary classification is grouping species into categories that show uh, evolutionary descent, a uh, relationship based on common ancestors rather than just looking at physical uh, similarities and differences. So phylogeny is the study of evolutionary histories of lineages of organisms. And we put similar organisms that have a common ancestor into groups called clads or clades, depending on how you want to say it. A group of species that includes a single common ancestor and all the descendants of that ancestor, both living and extinct. So in making these groups, we use diagrams that we call cladograms, which are branch diagrams, basically. And they show the link, the link of groups of organisms by showing their current hypothesis or current ideas about how that evolutionary uh, process worked in that particular group of organisms with living with different species coming off, uh, branching off from a common ancestor. So this is what they look like. Um, there's a couple things here. You can see the ancestral linkage. You can see where some type of splitting event where a new characteristic uh, came about that uh, happened in, in a new it's a species that um, developed this new characteristic. And we use something called derived characters to form these branches. So derived character is a trait that arose in the most recent common ancestor of a lineage and was passed on to its descendants. So you can see some examples here. In mammalia, hair would be a common, be a derived character. Uh, in carnivores, having shearing teeth or cutting teeth. Uh, in cats, having retractable claws, uh, and so on. So how do you go about interpreting or even making one of these cladograms? So a clad is a, a single common ancestor and all the, the descendants of that ancestor. So this diagram here represents a clad. The branching points represent the last point in which two groups shared a common ancestor. So in the example here, uh, marsupials branched off from other mammals uh, with, with the development of the pouch. So you can see uh, the derived characters are represented on the cladogram as well. And they sh so basically anything above the derived character has that character. So in the example here, having four limbs, uh, everything, amphibians, reptiles, marsupials, so on, all have those. Having amniotic eggs, amphibians don't have amniotic eggs, but everything else does. Having hair, that's in the mammals. The shearing teeth, that's in the carnivores, and then retractable claws, that's in the cats. So many traditional taxonomy groups do form valid clads, and we call those monophyletic groups, but not of the, not all of the, the traditional classification systems uh, do form a clad. Uh, protists, for instance, do not. They're paraphyletic. So one of the characteristics that's used a lot in evolutionary classification is looking at DNA sequences, looking at genes, looking at protein sequences. Molecular biology is a big part of modern evolutionary classification. So one of the things we know about DNA is that all organisms carry genetic information in the form of DNA. But we can use genes as derived characters. We can look at, there, there are common genes among different things because they all need these common proteins. And so we can look at how is the gene for hemoglobin, say, different in uh, humans versus chickens versus uh, some type of uh, uh, amphibian, whatever it is. So in general, the more derived characters two species share, the more recently they shared a common ancestor and the more closely re related they are in evolutionary terms. So they're going to be kind of further along in that cladogram. So some of these new techniques have changed the tree of life. They've changed how we classify things. Red pandas, for instance, used to be grouped with the other bears, but looking at molecular biology evidence, they probably are more closely related to raccoons. So the tree of life 
Um, and again, this started with Darwin. He drew d these types of diagrams as well, but he didn't use, you know, obviously molecular biology. Uh, and but the Tree of Life illustrates current hypotheses regarding the evolutionary relationships among the taxa within the three domains of life. So here you can see kind of a very simplified version of the Tree of Life here with the bacteria, the earliest species, and then the archaea coming in, and then all the eukaryotes, the eukarya, um, all of those different groups there, the plants, the fungi, uh, the protists, and the animals. So let's look at these domains. Why do we have two domains that are only one kingdom? The two different kinds of bacteria. The bacteria domain, which is the eubacteria kingdom, and the archaea, which is the archaeobacteria kingdom. So they're both unicellular and they're both prokaryotic. They do have cells with thick rigid cell walls, but what's different is this, the bacteria have a different type of cell wall. They are all bacteria. Uh, in the bacteria domain, they range from free living organisms to those that are parasitic, that are harmful. In the archaean kingdom, they have, again, like I said, a different kind of cell wall structure. Uh, they don't have peptidoglycan in their cell wall that bacteria do. Um, they also live in very extreme environments, places where a lot of things can't survive. Hot springs, high salt concentrations, down in the bottom of the of the mud at the bottom of a swamp, places where there's not much oxygen available, uh, is where you find these guys. In the eukarya domain, you've got a bunch of different things. You've got the protists, which is kind of this catch-all group. If it's if it's a eukaryote, it's not a plant, it's not an animal, it's not a fungus. It ends up in the protist kingdom, so it's a very diverse kingdom. And then you have the fungi as well. So protists are mostly unicellular. There are some multicellular ones like kelp. Uh, some of them are heterotrophs. Uh, others are photosynthetic, like the euglena in the picture here. So again, very diverse group. Fungi are for the most part multicellular, with the exception of things like yeast. Um, they are heterotrophs. Uh, which again we know means that they eat things that many of them are decomposers. Uh, they have cell walls, but they're made up of a protein called chitin. So it's different than the cell wall of bacteria and different than the cell wall of the plants. And that leaves us the two most ones we're most familiar with, the plants and the animals. So plants are multicellular and photosynthetic. Now sometimes some people will classify algae in with the plants, and those would be mostly unicellular, but in most cases, the algae go with the protists. Animals, on the other hand, are multicellular, they're heterotrophs, and at some point in their life cycle, they move. Not always the adult form, sometimes it's the larval form that moves, like with coral, but at some point in their life cycle, they're capable of moving.